into a new episode of the Bengals Beat Podcast. I'm your host, Kelsey Conway, here with Inquirer podcast producers, Sam Green and Phil Didion. We are just a week away from the Bengals kicking off the regular season, and there's a lot to talk about. Of course, no shortage of NFL news. So let's kick things off with just a rundown of the most recent news around the Cincinnati Bengals. The Bengals cut the roster down to 53 yesterday. The league mandates that teams get down to the 53-man roster cut down by 4 p.m. We had a chance to talk with Zach. Zach Taylor about the roster, and he said this was the most challenging cut down process he's ever been through since becoming the head coach of the Bengals because of how deep and talented this roster is. He's been on record saying that the roster has never been deeper than it is this season, and that came to fruition as you saw the cuts. Um, we'll just briefly go through them, but I, there wasn't a ton of surprises in that the Bengals returned to most of their starters. So there weren't a lot of starting battles up for grabs that you were wondering if the person that didn't get it, would they be cut? Um, these were more about the reserve spots and where did the Bengals go with some of those? Uh, so we'll start with the quarterback position, obviously that being one of the most important. It was Jake Browning that won the Bengals' number two quarterback role. He battled Trevor Simeon all training camp long, and he won the job. Zach Taylor credited him for the way he played in training camp and said that regardless of if they were to bring anyone else in, it is Browning's job as the number two backup quarterback. And that's an important role. Uh, right now, it's unclear what Joe Burrow's timeline is for return and Zach Taylor said, we'll see when asked if he's going to practice today, which is Wednesday, the week before the Bengals-Browns game. It sounds like Burrow will practice. We'll see, though. Um, but that was the most encouraging update. But if there is a scenario in which Burrow isn't able to play for week one or does suffer an injury during the season, it's going to be Browning's job. And that's a big it's a big job because the Bengals felt very comfortable with Brandon Allen over the last couple of years, and he's no longer on the team. So Browning is the guy behind Burrow. Um, the Bengals also made a transaction this morning in signing Will Greer, who most recently spent time with the Dallas Cowboys drafted by the Carolina Panthers in the third round of the 2019 draft. He is going to be on the practice squad, but that's another insurance policy at quarterback for the Bengals. Some other notable things about Bengals 53-man roster is that they kept four running backs that Travion Williams really wasn't able to to do anything during training camp. And there was a thought that that might get in the way of him making the team, but the Bengals decided they'd seen enough with Travion in years past that they wanted to make sure that behind Joe Mixon, it is going to be Chase Brown, Travion Williams, and Chris Evans. I thought that was a little bit of a surprise there to keep four instead of three, but good for Travion Williams in that, you know, injuries happen and you hate to see them getting in the way of players making the team and the Bengals know what they have in Williams. So he will be on the roster this year. Wide receivers, they kept six. No real surprises there. The team decided to move on from Trent Taylor, their veteran wide receiver slash returner. That was kind of obvious when they decided to draft Charlie Jones because he is going to resume the role of the punt returner for the Bengals and you know there's just only so many roster spots that you can have and I know the Bengals really like Trent Taylor but it was time to go younger and Charlie Jones is now going to be the guy. Tight ends I thought that it might be a little bit of a battle there between Mitchell Wilcox and Tanner Hudson but it was Wilcox that the Bengals decided to go with Tanner Hudson was a preseason favorite but again the Bengals are showing a theme here. If you've been in their system and they're comfortable with you you'll likely get a chance to stick around and that's what happened with Wilcox because he was not able to practice at all until the Bengals removed him from the pup list last week. So three tight ends there. Drew Sample backing up Irv Smith. They really like what Drew Sample can do from a blocking standpoint. So those are the guys there at tight end. Nine offensive linemen. 
No real surprises here either, other than um, Hakeem Adeniji, someone fans have been familiar with over the last couple of years because of the amount of time he's been thrusted into the starting lineup. He is no longer on the team. Um, you're looking at Cody Ford, Trey Hill, Deontay Smith, Max Sharping, and Jackson Carmen as your backups to those five starters on the offensive line. Same thing on the defensive line. Arguably where the Bengals are deepest is uh, Cam Sample, Miles Murphy, Jay Tufeli, Zach Carter and Josh Tupo really round out that group. And as I reported earlier this week on Cincinnati.com, Joseph Osai suffered a high ankle sprain. He is doubtful to play against the Browns next week. And with high ankle sprains, you know, you never know how long it might be for him to be able to return. But that defensive line group looks like it's built to withstand injuries like that. So look for Miles Murphy to get a little bit more action early on with Osai out for an under determined amount of time right now. Linebacker, absolutely no shock there. That group has been set for a while now and is a really strong group for Lou Anarumo. At cornerback, the Bengals decided to go with their younger guys as opposed to some of the older guys like Sidney Jones, the veterans. Um, they're they're uh, making their stamp here with their rookie draft picks this year and DJ Turner and DJ Ivy. Those guys are probably going to see playing time at various points this year because as you know, 17 game season is a long season and you can never have too many cornerbacks. Safety, Tyson Anderson and Jordan Battle will back up Dax Hill and Nick Scott. And for your specialists, really the only big news to come out of that is that Brad Robbins beat out Drew Chrisman for the spot and that was expected, but just finalized there with that specialist group. So that's your Bengals 53-man roster. As I said, not really a ton of surprises there, but looks to be a pretty strong group that Zach Taylor is very excited about. Now for an update on Joe Burrow, a question that everyone is probably wondering about is when is he coming back to practice and what's going on with his contract extension we don't know when he's coming back to practice. I asked Zach Taylor. He said, we'll see in specific to if he's going to practice this week. I'm headed over to cover practice here in an hour after I tape this podcast. So be sure to follow along for updates there as far as if number nine is on the field. And I followed up by asking Zach Taylor, does Burroughs practice availability have any connection to what's going on with his contract? Because as of right now, the Bengals and Burrow have yet to agree on a long-term extension for the quarterback. That's been the number one priority for the team, and they've yet to been able to get it done. And Zach Taylor also said no to that. So it doesn't sound like Burrow is holding in and not coming back because of the contract. So we will just see where things stand in terms of where his injury health gets to and where the contract gets to because time is ticking. There's not that much time left before the Bengals will travel to Cleveland to kick things off. And you'd like to think that the Bengals will have the extension done by then, but we'll see. You'd also hope that ba that Burrow is able to get a week's worth of practice to make sure he's really ready to go for that week one game against the Browns, which is probably going to be a good battle knowing how those two teams have matched up against one another in the last couple of weeks. So that's just a couple of quick updates and analysis on what's going on with the Bengals. Be sure to follow along, as I said, throughout the week and weekend. We'll keep you posted on everything you want to know about Burrow. But I'm really excited about what we're going to bring to you next on this podcast. And that is a conversation with a guy that I have admired for a long time in this business. I think he's one of the best analysts in the game, specifically draft analysts, but he knows a ton about the NFL and his name is Mike Renner. You might have known his work from his time with Pro Football Focus. Uh, he's, he was there for years and I watched and followed his work and he's been generous enough to, as someone who lived in Cincinnati for the last couple of years, join me every week to talk about the Bengals, to go over what happened in the games and give his analysis. And then, you know, it'd be really awesome to have Mike contributing to this podcast specifically when it comes around draft time. So really excited about Mike. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Mike Renner. Thank you, Mike, thanks for joining me. Oh, thanks for having me. I know I'm not in Cincy anymore, but I still love mm -hmm. the Bengals. I think last time I saw you, though, was actually after a Cincinnati Notre Dame game. And I think yes. I was hammered and dipping my hands in your ranch dressing. 
eating so um, <laughs> chicken nuggets. That was a <laughs> dark time. I think I was, I was riding, I was riding my high and you were riding your low. And that was still one of my favorite days good. since I've moved back to Cincinnati. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, I know, um, I'm, a, I'm bummed that we're not going to be able to do this in person because you're no longer in Cincinnati, but I'm really excited for you for what you're going to be doing down in Nashville with this new chapter of your life. Yes, I'm going to be working now at The Messenger, which is a brand new startup sports section. As At the time of recording this, we don't even have a sports section live. But next week, prior to week one, we will be dropping. I'll be dropping some draft stuff, a mock draft, a draft board prior to the season for that. And then they'll be doing a lot of draft rookie uh, player evaluation focused stuff over the course of this season. So very excited for that to kick off here. I think that obviously your draft work speaks for yourself, but I've always enjoyed your broader view of the NFL. And you and I were just talking about it, but like so much of the draft is related to what goes on during the season. So even though your main title is a draft analyst, which we're so lucky that you're going to be able to share some of that knowledge, because I've always thought you're one of the best draft analysts in the business. But you like we were saying, you got to cover what each team is doing. So there's a lot going on that you have to pay attention to. So you were able to really key in on the Bengals though living in Cincinnati. So obviously the last couple of years, I'm sure you've had your fun being able to go tailgate at the games. But obviously from a football standpoint, you have been able to watch the tape and really key in on what the Bengals have done. So other than Joe Burrow and just how amazing he's been <laughs> since you've been in Cincinnati for years. What would you attribute the Bengals turnaround to really being about, whether it's dra- hitting on draft picks, free agents, like from your perspective, what do you think it's been about? Yeah, I, to me, there's two massive things. One is, you know, I was Joe, I'm outside of Joe Burrow, obviously. One <laughs> is Jamar Chase, like legit playmakers offensively. I think that's the name of the game in today's NFL is dynamic guys who can take your run of the mill play. And we've seen it with Jamar Chase, you know, a zillion times, a jump ball down the football field, a screen, a slant, whatever it is that, you know, your normal human being playing NFL wide receiver either doesn't make or only gains five or six yards. Take those plays and make them into chunk games, 20 plus yard games, big touchdowns. Those are the game-changing plays that, uh, truthfully, again, if you don't have a guy like Jamar Chase, just stop existing in your offense, and you just take massive steps back. So I think it's that. And then the other thing is defensively, the sort of mindset, how they built this defense is no holes, is is attempting to just be solid at every single position. You know, they don't have – it's kind of the opposite of what I just talked about offensively. Offensively, it's the guys that can change the game that make a difference. Defensively, it's the guys that won't change the game that make a difference. They don't have or have not had guys that are true liabilities on the defensive side of the ball that opposing offenses can target, whether it's in the run game or the passing game. And so I always kind of, you know, with my job, I take a look at when I'm watching teams, I'm doing from a player evaluation focus. And I think that then gives you the broader picture the more you evaluate each player in depth and how they fit into a scheme. And just when I watch this Bengals defense, it's so, so many guys who are so flexible in what they're capable of doing. So many guys who can wear a bunch of different hats, play a bunch of different roles. And with Lou Anarumo, he asks them to do it. It gives them a flexibility to game plan week to week and put out something different. And that's why they've had one of the most consistent defenses in the NFL over the past two years. So we're going to get into some questions here with Mike. I thought it would be fun for us to kind of just do an overview of our some of our predictions for the Bengals season. But just off the top of your head, are you willing to say that the Bengals are still the biggest threat to the Chiefs in the AFC? I don't think so anymore, sadly. Okay. But it's not their Please fault. tell us why. I think they're a better roster than they were last year. I think because the Jets have Aaron Rodgers. I, I, truthfully, it's like the Jets were a top three defense in the NFL last season. They should only be better this year. And now you add Aaron Rodgers. Like, all they were missing was offense. They had a winning record last year with freaking Zach Wilson playing the worst quarterback of anyone in the NFL. So you mm-hmm. add now a you know Hall of Famer, four-time MVP, who, in my opinion, was still playing, still has the talent. Like Last year was more he was checked out from the Packers than it was him not still having it. So I think they're the biggest threat. 
Now, again, you're splitting hairs in the AFC because mm -hmm. it's such right. an absurdly talented conference. There's like four teams that, you know, any like that like six years ago before kind of this consolidations of power, like would have been your top Super Bowl contender, like Chiefs, Jets, Bengals, Bills, all four of those, you know, any given year should be teams that like you're saying are the best team in the NFL, but it's just the way the NFL has kind of shook out where we have a lot of halves in the AFC and not a lot of have uh, and some big have nots around the NFL that it's really consolidated to those four teams. But I think those four teams are all elite and it's like, you really got to get a little bit lucky when it comes to winning uh, the AFC this season. I'm so glad you said that because so much of it is luck and so much can change if certain injuries happen. I mean, gosh, the second day of training camp, Joe Burrow goes down and the original thought, and obviously none of the reporters are doctors and that's why we're reporters, but it was like, did he just tear his Achilles? And then you immediately think, how many games can the Bengals even win without him? So, so much of it is, and, you know, hopefully he's going to be able to go week one. I'm um, heading over to practice in a couple minutes. Um, and Zach Taylor said yesterday, we'll see if he's going to practice, but hopefully he's going to be able to play next week again for the Browns. But like we're saying, it's just so much can change and so much of it is luck. Um, so, yeah, I think the AFC, I mean, it's going to be musty TV every week to watch AFC teams. Um, and the Bengals are certainly one of those. So I thought it would be fun to play a little game here and go over um, topics that we think are going to be a, a big deal this year. And I like when I was going through them, I really wanted to think of things that might stump you and I and make us think about it other than just the normal, you know, who's going to be the best player on the team. Well, of course, you know, that's going to be number nine. So um, let's start it off with your thoughts on the most important player for the Bengals other than Joe Burrow. I thought about this one a lot and, and truly I believe it is Jonah Williams right tackle for uh, two reasons. One is him switching positions and, you know, going from left side to right side, he obviously played right tackle freshman year at Alabama, but then was left tackle ever since then. So it's not completely new, but it is a little new. And, and to that, like, I think there's a path to him, you know, you, we would have asked me after his second, third season, I would have said, this is a guy on a trajectory to be, you know, borderline pro bowl offensive tackle in the NFL. Last season was nothing close to that. I mean, he was, he was damn near a liability on the left side. Serious play strength issues. I just wonder if he comes back this season and if he has a bounce back year. Because you, you know Orlando Brown Jr. solid. That's why you went out and paid him. Because mm -hmm. whether it was if Baltimore, whether it was if Casey, he was consistent, healthy, solid on the left side. You, you pay for that certainty. But I, I think there's a world where Jonah Williams has a bounce back year and all of a sudden – you have a very quality tackle duo, and all of a sudden you have the best offensive line since Joe Burrow's been there. But that's obviously a big if that he has a bounce back here. We barely saw him in the preseason, not enough to know if he really is changed in that regard. But if he's still the guy we saw last year, I still don't think this offensive line is going to have enough when, when you come playoff time and you have to bl block the likes of guys like you know Von Miller in the AFC or what the Jets are throwing out with like five different defensive ends that are high quality guys there that defensive line so that to me is the biggest one if he steps it up if he goes back to the form we saw from early on his career this is a team that you know that could be the missing piece the thing that changes the Bengals fortune this year that's such a refreshing thought because so much has been talked about Orlando Brown Orlando Brown Orlando Brown that what Jonah is going to be is such an underrated storyline and He's looked really good in practice and he, you know, saw some time in that second preseason game, but it's still a different side. And, you know, his coaches have said he's handled it really well, but I think you're right. Like that's a really important piece. And I think just because maybe it, because it's the right side that it's not deemed as, you know, important as the left side, but mm -hmm. When you're playing Miles Garrett and you're playing TJ Watt and that is your division, those guys move around. Like TJ Watt, I believe, would line up on the right side. So he would yeah. be facing Jonah. Like in this division specifically, you have to have 
like two really good tackles. And I think that's a really nice, interesting thought from you because I really hadn't thought of it that much, but you're right. Because when things go wrong for the Bengals, the first conversation is always about the offensive line and you're, you know what you're going to get from Orlando Brown for the most part. Uh, Alex Kappa was, I I believe one of the best guards in the NFL last year. So I think if you're you're right in saying that if Jonah is good, you now open up the conversation to, wow, the Bengals could be even better than they have been. And they've been pretty darn good with not the best offensive line. Yeah, it's really like that's it. They, they, they get the offensive line. You give this this give this team like a top 12 offensive line in the NFL, leave it, which it would obviously be you know stretch for them to get there. But top 12 offensive line, there really is no limit on how on where this team could go and Jonah has something to play for he you know he wants his next contract and so mm-hmm. it's not like he obviously he wasn't necessarily happy about what happened in the offseason he, he wanted to play left tackle and he wasn't happy with how the Bengals handled that situation but he really has something to play for because he's entering the final year of his deal and he's going to want a long-term deal whether it be in Cincinnati or somewhere else so he's going to be trying to play his best ball. So hopefully it all works out and that he's really good and you can finally see for once what Burrow can be with a really talented offensive line. Um, all right, so let's move on. Yeah, if, if, if this offseason didn't light a fire under this guy, it's never right. going to happen, right? Hey, right. someone else took your job uh, and, hey, you don't have a contract after this year. <laughs> you know, like if, if he doesn't have something to play for, uh, he, he's never going to. I would assume that when you were doing – your draft work that year that um, you watched him play right tackle at Alabama. I know it was probably a long, a long time ago. Yeah, that was back his freshman year. And that was like when he put his name on the map, he was a fresh, true freshman starter at Alabama at right tackle. And everyone was kind of like, oh, wow, okay, this is going to be a guy. And I was really high on him coming out, but he really has the play strength has just been an issue. Maybe that, you know, it was a result of, you know, was it the shoulder injury right out the gate that he had or mm-hmm. the fact that just like couldn't get his play, his like weight up, but like he, he needs to get stronger to hold up to, you know, what Miles Garrett did to him last year was just criminal. <laughs> and he gets to see him. Well, he won't get to see him as much. That'll be Orlando's duty, but week one, um, yeah. he still haunts the Bengals. <laughs> but we can talk about that <laughs> next week more in depth. Um, okay. So let's move on to the next one I had. The Bengals will go back to the AFC championship if dot, 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 fill in the blanks. I just think stay healthy. I, I, that's how good they are. And, and truthfully, like a defensive side of the ball, they can afford some injury. They, they have depth, whether it's at linebacker, whether it's along the defensive line, even some in the secondary after this past draft. But it really is just in, avoiding that key injury that – you know, like the Bills suffered last year when they lost Von Miller, and that obviously took a big amount of teeth away from that defense. Like, they have an injury like that, and the Jets are healthy, and the Bills are healthy, and the Chiefs are healthy. You're just behind the eight ball. So it's avoiding that one key injury, and that's the case. I think they're going back there, truthfully. Wow. All right. Let's see what else I got for you. Okay. What could be the Bengals' biggest shortcoming? I obviously offensive line. We discussed that at nauseum, though. Uh, we don't need to hammer on that. But should we? Should we put a tally on how many times we're going to talk about that for the next six months? Oh, oh I mean, <laughs> we'll have to cut ourselves off at some point. We need to, like yes. a cat show that we yeah. can mention the offensive line because people are sick of hearing about it. But it's like that yeah. is why <laughs> you know that, right. that is your issue. But I, I do think youth in the secondary was the other thing I had on it. It's like you have. A couple second-year starters from last year's draft, backing them up. You have a couple rookies. Like I, I do think that this secondary, there's more unknowns than we've been talking about. You know, for Eli Apple, for all his like shortcomings and not being the greatest, he kind of knew what you were going to get. And so this year, there's really Good some point. unknowns in this secondary, whether it's Dax Hill, Cam Taylor, Britt. So I, I just think that you're dealing with again. Luan Rumo's defense week to week is very different. It's a complex scheme. They 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 do a lot of different things. There's no one thing they hang their hat on. And so asking young players to be that diverse, and obviously like that's why they drafted Daxon Hill where they did, is because 
that's what he was doing at Michigan too. Like he was a slot, but then also could play deep safety, but then also play outside corner. So that's why they wanted him. But you know, it's easier to say he's going to be great on paper than to say what it's going to be like when the lights actually come on. So I think that's the other thing that I'm just like, not saying it's going to be for sure an issue, but I'm just, I'll believe it when I see it with this secondary that they can be as good as they were past couple of years. What was your, not to put you on the spot, your draft thoughts on Cam Taylor Britt? Because he's been really good in training camp, and I know they're really excited about what he can be. I loved watching his tape at Nebraska because he was so physical on tape. To me, he was a guy who I thought could even switch to safety because he's such a hitter, such a tackler. And I think you saw that as a rookie. like You, you saw him not back down from anyone. I still have questions about whether he can be like a pure man match corner, but, but they don't lot, do a lot of that in that defense. They aren't, you know, and when they are doing a lot of man coverage, it's like drop eight man coverage where they have a lot of help. So um, I think for that scheme, I'm excited to see what he can do because he could be, he could be, you know, more of a tone setter game changing play type of guy than they've had in that secondary. What uh, what about DJ Turner? Since we're talking about this secondary, what was your draft recap on him? So truthfully, like all the Bengals picks, I, I think I had within 10 spots on my draft board of where they actually got drafted. Oh. So like the value of all of them, I was like, he, they, that was where I would have taken them. So DJ Turner, I think he went 60th. I had him 67th on the draft board. I, I had some concerns about not some concerns like the main concerns were his size you know small frame and i worry that he didn't play overtly physical when you're on the smaller end you get to the nfl and the wide receivers are all like 190 195 plus they you know you get matched up against a guy i'm trying to think like amari cooper it's like 215 he'll just push you around so I, that was my worry about him the man to speed the makeup ability i, I think there's a role for him um uh, in this defense to play even with what they have right now uh, in place, just because he's, you know, you go up against a team with a true speed wide receiver. I, I think you want DJ Turner on the football field, following that guy around because it is so impressive to watch him be able to you know, give up a step, but then make it up because no one's getting past that guy. Well, and, and you know how much, Lou Anarumo likes to play multiple defensive backs on the field. And if you even look at how the Ravens have changed, having that third corner. I mean, because now, you know, the Ravens having Mark Andrews, Odell Beckham, and Zay Flowers on the field, you know, you got a lot of different players who can provide different things and having DJ Turner to be able to mix in there and then also having him as your insurance policy. I mean, one of the biggest takeaways I've had so far is the Bengals cornerback room from this time last year compared to now is far beyond better because of players like Cam Taylor, Britt, and DJ Turner. And that speaks to the way that they've been drafting over the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, I think DJ Turner, like you said, is going to have a role, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on him because we were just talking about the secondary and I know he'd be someone who'd be a little bit fresher on your mind. Um, but since we're kind of talking about the defense before I move on, um, I reported a couple of days ago that Joseph Osai has a high ankle sprain and he suffered that in the Bengals final preseason game. And that means he's going to likely miss the first week and potentially a couple more weeks after that. So now you're looking at, is he a IR candidate? Um, you know, high ankle sprains are tricky, but that means someone who I'm sure you've studied very well, very in depth is Miles Murphy. I, I know that with Osai ahead of him, it wasn't looking like Miles Murphy would see a ton of time this year. But now with Osai out for who knows how long, Miles Murphy's now going to be edge number three on this roster. So what do you think he can bring, knowing what Trey Hendrickson and Sam Hubbard already bring? Yeah. First off with Osai, I, I am so disappointed. It was so disappointed when I heard you report that because he looked like he had taken the next step this preseason. It, it, just going back to what, you know, I saw from him in Texas to now, he, he looks so much stronger. It, it, he looks like he's put on 10 to 15 pounds of muscle since, you, you know, mm -hmm. which isn't unexpected. A super young guy coming out. I think he's still like 23 years old. So I, I think whenever he does come back, 
he even if as a role player as a like rotational guy, I think he's going to be an impact dude. Miles Murphy, though, for him, I don't think I, I would not expect much as a rookie. That that was like the. I think that's important to set expectations. I think everyone just assumes he's a first rounder. He's supposed to come in and have five or six sacks right away. So I, I, I'm interested to hear why you think this. So just going back to what he did at Clemson last year, he went up against the guy in Joe all at Notre Dame, who was like, you know, probably going to be a first round pick next year who just, well, a, a technically sound off the tackle at the collegiate level, which is somewhat rare. And he didn't get a single pressure against him. Whole game, 1v1, nothing. Because Murphy really is just an athlete first, figuring out how to rush the passer. And those guys can see the field. Like, you're not going to worry too much about him in the run game. I think, like, he could make an impact in that regard. If you want to play him first and second downs, let Hendrickson be fresh for third downs, you can get away with that. I don't think he's going to be too much of an issue there. Uh, I think he could be fine because he is so physically gifted, so strong at the point of attack. Like he can do that, but he just didn't use his hands well, really had one move in a long arm bull rush that if you got one move at the NFL level, tackles know that they study tape. They watch, they'll go back and watch your college of Clemson. They'll go back and watch you in the preseason and know that if you got one thing that you hang your hat on, they can take it away from you. They're good enough. These are professionals. So uh, that's the worry with them is that he really is just a one trick pony at the moment that needs a few more moves to get it done, needs a little more season thing. And he's got to get it, right? Like, it, it'll happen in time. He reminded me a lot of a guy like Rashawn Gary coming out who didn't do anything as a rookie. Second year, he started to see it come on. Then third year, all of a sudden, he's uh, borderline uh, all-pro, pro bowl type of defensive end. So that's the career arc you're hoping for with the Miles Murphy. But as you said, expectations out the gate. You're hoping he can be a rundown guy that keeps, you know, your pass rushers fresh. Yeah, that's it kind of seems that way. But I mean, he's got great people to learn from in Trey Hendrickson and Sam Hubbard. So I think that but sometimes you learn more about the guys when they get thrown into the fire. But I agree. What a bummer for Osai, because he's just got so much God given talent and he looked better than I've ever seen him during training camp. And he's just dealt with so many injuries and None of them are, you can't control them. And, you know, he, Zach Taylor said he needed more game reps because he does need game reps. He hasn't played enough in game settings that they need to be able to show him teachable moments and really see what they have in him. So people, you know, might question why Zach had him in. Well, they need to know what they have in Osai. And the only way you can do that is playing him in games. And it's not like you're going to take in a regular season game, Trey Hendrickson off the field, just so you can play Osai. You got to play your best player. So I didn't really understand why so many people didn't understand, you know, why Zach Taylor was, was making that decision. But um, yeah, hopefully he can come back sooner rather than later because they looked like they were going to have a pretty deep edge rushing group with him behind Sam and, and Trey and with Miles there. So hopefully he can come back and really provide something um, because it's kind of a make or break year for him, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, it is still what? Is this year three for Osai? Yeah. I think so. You know, they're not completely make or break, but it is like if you're planning for the future with kind of how they have the contracts coming up, you need to know if he's going to be part of your future plans or not. And this is a year where you're going to figure that out. And truthfully, again, I think you've seen enough to think that a guy at his age, still so young, that it's it's only a matter of time. It feels like with Joseph Osai. I'll save all of my Joseph Osai draft questions for you for when he comes back and we get the news go. that he's coming back because I would love to hear what you studied from him at Texas because I wasn't covering the Bengals at that point yet. So I would love to hear um, more on what you saw from him at Texas. So before... Um, we wrap it up. I'll I'll ask you this, and we'll go on both sides of the ball. Who, in your opinion, other than Joe Burrow, is going to be the Bengals' offensive player of the year? And then we'll switch the defensive side of the ball and go defensive player of the year. It just it has to be Jamar Chase. Right? I love T. Higgins. I think he's an exceptional number two wide receiver. If you're ranking the number two wide receivers across the NFL, he's top. So real. That's a real course. testy. Tessie, thing you just said, not a lot of people like to say he's a number two. <laughs> uh, I just like when you're, I mean, anywhere, he'd be a number one a lot of teams. It just like Jamar's, Jamar's different, right? Mm -hmm. He's, there aren't guys built like him. 
six foot 201 that run the mid four threes that can get by pretty much any DB they want because he's just so physically strong for a guy that size. And, you know, I loved when they were throwing him at running back and doing some Debo Samuel stuff with him because he could do that. You know, not a lot of wide receivers can. So Jamar Chase is just, I mean, you're ranking top receivers in the NFL. He, he's somewhere in the top five. And and he's and he wins the areas you want to win, right? He is a downfield, explosive wide receiver that they're just not the same way he's not on the field. So, yeah, it, it's Jamar Chase. It'll be, in my opinion, Jamar Chase as long as he's in a Bengals uniform here. And then on the defensive side of the ball? I'm going to go DJ Reader. Now, injured two out of the last three years in a Bengals uniform, but that, when he's healthy, man, he, he's so impactful. I'm hoping for a full healthy season from him. We shall see. Just so strong. One of the true, versatile, all-around DTs in the NFL. There aren't many. It's a difficult position to make an impact from. A lot of teams don't even like, don't even try to go out and sign. Don't even cover that position because there's just there's only like five or six guys that are really like doing it at a high level that can play, you know, one tech, nose tackle, three tech that can really line up anywhere on the interior. He is one of them. So. Should be still in his prime. You know, he's not getting up too old just yet. So uh, I'm looking for a big year from DJ Reader. I think he should be the, their defense player there. Yeah, I mean, I sing the praises of DJ Reader all the time. And you saw, I don't remember, I don't remember if you saw the Bengals game against the Saints last year, or uh, gosh, I don't know if it was the year before that. Uh, but I think the Saints rushed for like over 200 yards because DJ wasn't playing and you know them going up against the teams that run the ball the way they do in the AFC and specifically in the division you can't explain how important DJ Reader is to this team um, more than we just talked about there so before I let you go I do want to ask you because I don't know what's going to happen this week and if it will happen before the next time I talk with you do you have do you think it's going to be a major deal if we get to next week and it's game week and Joe Burrow does not have his contract extension done? I don't think so. I I, I think the pressure from the public fans and the pressure from basically you know the or, any other player in the organization means that they'll they'll do what it takes. The, the, the Bengals will do what it takes to get a deal done with Joe Burrow. So uh, if it doesn't happen right now, I'm not too worried. A again, you have multiple years to figure this out afterwards. I, I, I even with, you know, whether it's a franchise tag, fifth year, th they'll be fine. It, it, it'll happen. It, I can see from his end wanting to honestly bet on himself and wait, you know, the mm -hmm. contracts keep going up. Every new contract gets higher. And so, <laughs> the next contract that signs, he's going to top it. So uh, I, I, I'm not worried if I'm a Bengals fan about Joe Burrow not being there for as long as you know his useful career is. Okay, well, I'm officially on Joe Burrow. I've been on Joe Burrow contract watch, <laughs> and then I was on Joe Burrow injury watch. So basically, I'm just on Joe Burrow watch over Joe Burrow here. Watch. <laughs> but um, thank you so much for joining me. You were great. I'm really looking forward to being able to talk with you every week. I think you're just going to bring so much good insight and analysis to this podcast, and we are lucky to have you. I'm excited. I get to stay connected to Cincy. I love the city, so glad to do it. All right. I'll talk to you next week. Yep, see you, Kelsey. Thanks, Mike. All right. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Bangless Beat Podcast. We'll catch you guys next week.